Welcome to another episode of In Range. I'm holding in my hand today an original 1860 Colt percussion revolver. This one made right near the end of their run in 1871. Still works. But what I want to talk to you about today is the dreaded chain fire. And this has come to my attention how much this is a concern amongst the viewership and some of the community when it comes to percussion revolvers. I recently produced a short about loading the 1836 Colt Patterson revolver, Colt's very first commercial attempt at a revolver, and I loaded it through the historical process, not using any of the modern methods. And the historical process was dictated by Colt himself and was included in instructions at least up to and including the 1851 Navy, of course, decades later, in which he states you load the powder, seat the ball, prime the nipple with a percussion cap, and proceed to fire. In fact, his instructions specifically state to not use any grease or wadding. And that goes against modern safety precautions, and I'm going to talk about that more in a minute. But first of all, let's talk about what a chain fire is. A chain fire is when you fire one chamber, and more than one chamber goes off. It can be quite disconcerting. So the main one goes off, and let's say the one to the right of it goes off. It could be any number of the chambers could go off simultaneously, up to including all six of them, potentially. This, of course, induces a lot of recoil. Um, the projectiles leave uh, whatever chamber they're in. If they're aligned with the gun, the, the projectile will actually hit any part of the gun that the projectile is aligned with. And this induces a lot of recoil. In theory, can damage the gun, although with proper soft lead, generally speaking, it does not. And in theory, could harm or hurt the person shooting the gun should some of the shrapnel from the chain fire strike them. Of course, a good reason to be wearing eye protection properly. Now, that said, I have experienced a chain fire because I induced one intentionally. We're going to get to that more in the video later. And it is a disconcerting event. But I have also seen chain fires, and I have never seen anyone actually get hurt, nor have I ever seen the gun actually get damaged. But of course, I would recommend against trying to have one. Now, certainly there are people that have been hurt, and certainly their guns have been damaged. So I'm not saying that doesn't happen, but generally speaking, it does not. But of course, it is desirable to prevent a chain fire. When you're firing the chamber aligned with the barrel, you don't want only that one to go off, and then you have five more shots, ostensibly, in the gun to continue firing the purpose of a six shot revolver. Well, I just want to take a moment to remind you that InRange is a completely viewer supported project. We receive no revenue from YouTube whatsoever, not or YouTube Red, no advertising, nothing, a proactively demonetized channel. We also have no corporate sponsors and no overlords. Only you, the viewer, keep InRange alive. And if you'd like to see this kind of content and continue keeping InRange alive so that we can have an independent, unique voice here in the GunTuber space, please consider doing so via patreon.com slash InRange TV. Back in the day, and we're talking 1836, 1850s, 1860s, the original instructions, as I said, said to load powder, ball, with no grease or wadding, percussion cap, and fire. Um, as the revolver continued into its progression as a military firearm, most loading was not done with loose ball and powder. And in a box like this, you would open it up, open the wooden protector, and pour the cartridges in your hands, and you'd have paper cartridges. Obviously, you're not going to have any grease or wadding here because the cartridge is self-contained. There's powder in the paper cartridge attached to the projectile, and the projectile probably has some sort of grease or lubricant on it just to help deal with uh, fouling in the gun and keep it running reliably. Paper cartridge, bullet is lubed, percussion cap. You would merely seat the paper cartridge into the chamber, ram it home, place the primer on the nipple, and that is the historical way to load it. So in that regard, when you load with paper cartridges, you're not loading with loose ball, you're not loading, loading with, a loose, with loose powder, and you are therefore not using any grease on the mouth or any wad between the bullet or the projectile and the powder. So why was chain fires not a big deal, historically speaking, but such a concern nowadays? And I think personally, I know why. And I think the reason was, a number of them, but the main reason was, the projectiles back in the day were oversized properly so that when they were seated into the chamber, they sealed the chamber sufficiently with enough surface area, specifically with conical bullets, which actually have more surface area than round ball, 
And as a result, when the chamber is fired and lots of fire happens with a revolver, especially in this gap, the fire cannot leap from one chamber to the next to set off the next chamber. Now, one of the things you hear about when it comes to uh, chain fires is that the chain fire is induced either from the front, fire leaping from one chamber to the other, from beyond the projectile, or from the rear to a loose fitting cap. So for example, you fire one round and one of the caps falls off of one of the chambers, uh, one of the nipples, you fire another round and fire coming around gets through the nipple to the chamber and sets off that chamber. Well, a while back when I was filming Revolvers in the Rain, I did some experiments that I now have the archival footage for to show you a chain fire because I induced one. And the way I induced one intentionally and reliably was to use reliably undersized projectiles. So what I mean by that is when you seat the projectile on here, you have to have a certain diameter of the round ball. And the vast majority of people are using 0.452 or 0.454 projectiles, even in modern revolvers or even in historic ones, if they happen to have one. And I always go with larger than that, 0.457, which you can get swaged versions thereof from Hornady. And that's my preference. I always use 0.457 or I always use conicals when loading these types of guns. And when using the right size projectiles, I have never experienced a chain fire. But I went ahead and went down to smaller projectiles intentionally, below 0.452, even I was firing 0.450 balls, and it didn't take long, two cylinders worth, before this happened. All right, you can see there, that's a chain fire. And if we analyze this video very closely, You'll notice that the cap in the chamber that is facing the camera is still on, but that chamber did detonate in the chain fire. And that tells me something very specifically. There's no way the fire leapt from one chamber to the other through a percussion cap that was seated still on the nipple. But it does mean that it did leap past from one chamber to the other, down past the ball, and got to the primary charge, thus detonating that chamber. To me, the chamber facing the camera in that footage is very indicative of the reality of what causes a chain fire. A chain fire is induced by having an improperly sized projectile with insufficient surface area, sealing the mouth of the chamber from fire leaping from one chamber to the other in regards to not setting it off. Now, so historically speaking, using paper cartridges, or using properly sized round balls, you would not get a chain fire. But in the modern era, using undersized round balls, and most people use round balls, thus providing less surface area for sealing the chamber, very few people use conicals in the modern uh, era of shooting percussion revolvers, reproductions included, means that using modern precautions to prevent a chain fire isn't a bad idea. So here would be the modern approach to loading the gun, a round ball, probably not a conical, a felt lubricated wad between the ball and the powder, and a percussion cap. Here's where things go wrong in the modern area. Most people use undersized round balls or undersized percussion caps and they just squeeze them to fit. An undersized round ball can allow for fire to transfer past the round ball to the charge and a loose percussion cap can fall off and theoretically allow fire to get from one chamber to another through the back end. Properly sized percussion caps that fit properly sized round balls that actually swage down into the cylinder chamber and a felt wad will not hurt. So this is the modern way of loading this gun and there's nothing wrong with this, but it is not historical. If you wanna add more grease in front of that, go for it. The wad definitely does help prevent chain fires. I'm not saying it doesn't, I'm just saying it's not required. If you wanted to go additionally one further step and add literally slather on lubricant to the front of the chamber mouths, that would be added protection. That said, I have tried using grease on the mouth of my chambers, not for the purposes of preventing chain fires, but for the purpose of just having less fouling in the gun running over time. And out here in this Arizona desert, even when it's not that hot, that grease, even with a lot of wax, just melts and starts pouring out of the gun. And when it's in your holster, it's just a gooey mess. Slathering grease on the front of these chambers is not a reliable solution, at least in these conditions and in this environment. So I think that that's a complete waste of time. 
I do think that the felt wads provide some modicum of protection and they do provide uh, some form of lubricant and cleaning of the barrel when the gun is fired so you can continue firing with less fouling. That said, you do not require nor need wads, nor do you need to slather grease onto the mouth of a chamber to properly and safely use a percussion revolver without having a chain fire. Guys, thank you for watching this episode of InRange. If you found this interesting, um, please, of course, subscribe to the channel and share with your friends. And once again, remember, we are Patreon supported. Only viewers like you keep this channel alive. No corporate overlords, no advertising, no money from YouTube, only you, the viewer. So if you can do it, please find us at patreon.com slash inrangetv and support us so we can make more content like this for you. Thank you for watching.